Welcome back for another episode of The Art of Giving a Damn. My guests today are Andy Kramer and Al Harris. They are married lawyers and the authors of Breaking Through Bias, Communication Techniques for Women to Succeed at Work. And you guys have been together for over 30 years mentoring women, speaking and writing about gender communication. You have a really interesting viewpoint with it, but I got to start with, what inspired you to write this book and go into what you're doing now? Well, in the, uh, being in the trenches for the last 30 plus years as a practicing lawyer, um, what I found was that uh, women were not presenting themselves mm -hmm. in the best light that they could if we compare them to the way that men present themselves in the workplace. And so it was holding women back. Mm -hmm. uh, what we found was that it's primarily through gender stereotypes and biases mm -hmm. that result in people behaving and communicating in the way that they do. Mm -hmm. And so Al and I have been talking about this and writing about it for a very long time, yeah. uh, trying to find ways to make it so that women have a fair shake at advancing in their careers. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that I found and I suppose I'm like a lot of men who are absolutely convinced that they have no biases, they don't hold any stereotypes about women, and that they think mm -hmm. women are just as capable, just as ambitious mm -hmm. as men. I found that despite my assurance that I was absolutely fair, that the law firm that I was running was not promoting women anywhere near mm -hmm. in the proportions that men were being promoted that somehow, despite our wonderful, unbiased practices, mm -hmm. women were not making it in the same way that men were. And I was determined to figure out why. And I think that one of the mm -hmm. things that Andy and I, working together, have figured out is why that was. And the reason was, I'm not unbiased. We, are. I'm, mm -hmm. we all have biases. We all have stereotypes. And we all, if we're not careful and have the right sort of procedures and practices, we're all prone to act on those biases. Wow, that, that had to be kind of a fascinating realization to come to. I mean, you're both working together, you both have you know, legal degrees, and to realize that the bias was still happening despite being very educated and aware of it. So what do you say when you talk to people who do come back with that response of, well, of course, women are equal to men. I have no biases. Everybody's equal here. <laughs> do you get Do you get that a lot? We get that all the time. We get okay. that all the time. In uh, fact, we uh, yesterday we had a <laughs> workshop. We, we probably do a workshop or a, a lecture week. a week or so, and we were in a relatively small law firm in which mm -hmm. we had a mixed group of men and women, and. The women were absolutely cowed uh, to speak up in front of the men, and the men were absolutely assertive that there was nothing wrong with their law firm. They were perfect. Mm. And uh, afterwards, uh, we had many of the women come up to us and say, gee, now you see what we're up against. How do we get these men to recognize that women really have a tougher time than mm -hmm. men do? That we live in gendered organizations and very male-dominated norms and values and expectations. We need to do something to break that. Well, it's tough, but we try our best to speak to men as often as we can. Mm -hmm. So where do you start with that process of, if, if you're speaking with an organization or talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, to help them shift that, become aware enough of it that they can compensate in a sense for the bias that is it is natural I think a lot of us were programmed with that sometimes we don't even realize that I think we'll come back to this part in a minute Andy but even as a woman I find myself sometimes realize that I'm having a thought pattern that is very biased against other women thinking there's certain things we can't or shouldn't do and I have to go wait a minute where did that come from right. so what do you do to rewire that 
Well, part of it is information becomes very powerful. And so the first step is to understand what the stereotypes are that people tend to hold about women and men, work, leadership, families, home, children. And when we start to understand what those stereotypes are, then it can allow us to um, catch ourselves. And as you said, you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself saying, where did that come from? And biases and stereotypes start to develop by the time we're three or four years old. And so it's not going to change overnight when we get into our, you know, whatever our profession, our, our business, our workplace. Mm -hmm. And so the first step is an understanding of what they are. But that's very often where mm -hmm. a lot of um, diversity and inclusion training stops. Okay. But the problem is that then what do you do with it? And so mm -hmm. what we've been trying to do is we've been trying very hard to say, okay, these are what the issues are, but now mm -hmm. let's talk about what you can do about it. I love that. And so it's like there's multiple trains leaving mm -hmm. the station at the same time. Our book is about what women can do to overcome or to work around or to mm -hmm. confront head on the stereotypes and the biases that they face. But organizations need to be worried about making sure that they mm -hmm. have a fair and diverse organization. Mm -hmm. And the men who tend to run those organizations need to as well. And so we very often will offer tips and techniques that what men can do mm -hmm. and what organizations can do, because it isn't really just the women, although if women waited for organizations and men to get around to figuring this out, yeah. uh, we would be um, well past our careers at mm -hmm. that point. So that's really different moving parts at the same time. And that's such a different approach. I love that you're actually looking at it from all of those angles of the men in charge or whoever's in charge of the company, the company itself, and the women, because so often when we go into an issue like this, we're, we're waving that flag of, hey, this is a problem, but we don't know what to do to change it, or we're just calling out the problem without taking action to really change it. That's, that's a fantastic way to approach it. The... You know, Andy said that knowledge is power. The, yeah. the the trick with men is to get them to open up enough mm. that they accept the knowledge. And as we mentioned about the law firm yesterday, you know, it's a lot harder to get men to accept the fact that there's an issue here. If we do surveys, about 30% of the men will will acknowledge that women have a harder time advancing in careers mm -hmm. than men. If you ask women, the percentage is in the high 80s or 90s. Oh. So that women and men have a real disconnect about the pressures mm -hmm. and the problems that they face. So we've got to do a far better educational job with men. Women already get it. Women know that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. They may not know what to do about it, but they understand that they're up against barriers that men aren't. But we've got to get through to the men, and that's mm -hmm. a little harder. You know, one of the interesting things that we found um, about how to get through to the men so that they mm -hmm. actually are paying attention is that what I find is that when I'm speaking or, or working by myself with a group mm -hmm. and it's a uh, group of men, um, they really don't men, hear men me. And women. Well, and men and women. Mm. But the men really don't hear me right. the way that the women do. And so Al and I teaming up and doing this together, it is a lot like the, I can say something bad about my mom, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. He can say to them, guys, mm. you don't get it. But for me to do it, then their eyes are going to roll up in the back of their head or they're going to stop listening to me. And mm -hmm. so we've found that we have a very powerful way of getting the message across because 
we have both a woman and a man talking about these issues. Absolutely. I think in some ways you, you couldn't find a more effective combination because that forces somebody to look at it and go, oh, wow, I didn't really hear what she said, but I'm listening now that he's speaking. Mm -hmm. um, that's got to be an interesting effect to watch that light bulb come on for people. Well, it's kind of funny because after most of them, the women come up and ask me how they can find a guy who's got who's got it all figured out the way that it goes. So, so uh, it's pretty funny. He's uh, popular with He's with the ladies popular. on the presentations. Certainly very popular. <laughs> I would imagine. So, do you find that the gender bias? You know, there's a lot of people who say, "Well, it's not really an issue anymore. You can go to college. You can do whatever you want to do." You know, I grew up in the '80s, so I grew up during that women's empowerment kind of thing, and I still see it though. And it's hard because you're hearing people saying it's, it doesn't exist, and yet you see it, and more so you feel it, especially in certain circumstances and industries and situations. So do you, do you feel like over the 30 years, I guess, how much have you seen it shift? And, and are there certain areas where you feel like it's still more of something we have to work on than in other areas? Um, yes. Um Yes, there are other areas where it needs to be worked on more. Mm -hmm. If we look at women's careers up through college or even graduate school, mm -hmm. what we see is that women are doing at least as well, if not better than the men. Women are getting better grades. They are there in greater numbers. Getting mm -hmm. the awards. They're getting the awards. Mm -hmm. They're doing just fine. But when they leave academia, mm -hmm. When they go into careers, when they go into areas that are not judged, graded, evaluated on objective standards, yeah. but in which subjective judgments as to how well they're doing come mm -hmm. into play, then all of a sudden it turns out that women aren't doing as well as the men, mm -hmm. that the judgments about them get filled with bias. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some areas that are better than others. Uh, the bad areas, I mean, if we just look at places like uh, tech, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. engineering, those are areas in which women are way underrepresented and which they have an enormously hard time. Yeah. Areas where they do slightly better, law, uh, accounting, accounting. Uh, they do better, but even there, women don't get to the top in anywhere near the proportion that men do. Yeah. So we've got pockets mm -hmm. where things are better. Probably mm -hmm. accounting is probably at the top of that list, huh. but uh, but it's we, still not pretty. We we mm -hmm. we've got work in all of all of the major career areas. In fact, so any place where you can, you have high status, high compensation, mm -hmm. are male-dominated areas. No question about it. You know, it, it is interesting because when you look around at just taking tech as an example, you see very few female CEOs. It's male-dominated, not just in the CEO part, but the board of directors, the employees. When people find out that I actually started out as an entrepreneur coding, building websites, I now own a development team, I built software apps, and I can actually understand it and talk that language, they're shocked because I'm female, and I'm like, what century do we live in? <laughs> and people come back to me with that, um, and it's... It is very much still out there that people think there's certain roles, and I think you know there may be natural gifts and talents, but it's it's dependent on the individual person what their strengths are, and that goes back to what you're saying about when we're measured by merit by the actual numbers of performance in academic areas, you see something totally different than in the workplace when biases come in. That's fascinating. No question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's a different question for you. Uh, what was the first time that either of you remember actually seeing that bias or realizing it existed? Well, for me, um, it it came in different waves in mm -hmm. my in my life. But when I was 12 or 13 years old, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. 
So I told my parents, and they had one friend who was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And they asked him if he would meet me for lunch and talk to me about being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I meet this man for lunch. I'm, you know, a young teen. Mm -hmm. And he spends the entire hour telling me all of the reasons why I would not want to be a lawyer. Wow. That no one likes lady lawyers, that I would be alone, that no one would ever love me, I would never get married, I would never oh, have a goodness. family, I would never have any mm -hmm. friends, I would be isolated, and he spent the entire mm -hmm. time telling me that. Well, wow. obviously, it didn't affect my decision to become a lawyer, but it was the first time that I realized that there are strong opinions mm -hmm. about what's appropriate for a particular mm -hmm. career. And unfortunately for a lot of girls at growing up that that's what happens mm -hmm. because they believe what they're told and they give up. Um, yeah. The next sort of time that it hit me was when I was a young lawyer and I was called into a meeting. Mm -hmm. And because I go by Andy instead of Andrea, I got called into a meeting. Andy, we need you to come into this meeting. So as I'm walking into the meeting, I, the client whose back was at the door, he didn't mm -hmm. see me coming in. Mm -hmm. He says wait a minute, you mean to tell me that Andy's a girl? I can't oh. possibly work with a woman. Oh, my goodness. And so I needed to decide at that point how I was going to react. And so wow. I turned it into a joke, and I said, oh, of course, we obviously need to um, uh, start this over. I'm going to go out, walk in the hall a minute, come back in, and, you know, we're going to. And it turned out I worked with this man for 10, 15 years, and we never had a problem after that. But. If I had responded mm. differently, uh, it could have tainted the possibility of having a relationship uh, to work together. I love the way you responded there because I think a lot of times, sometimes that bias slips out. We hear it and we're like, I can't believe I just said that. And if you give the person a chance to go back, think that through and try it again, they'll come off totally differently because that's not actually who they want to be or how they show up. It's just something they're not even aware of at the moment. So that's a fantastic example of how to respond to that. Going back to the first story you shared, you know, I hear so many stories like that because I work with so many women entrepreneurs where at some point before, usually before they were 15, they had somebody tell them, no, you can't do that. Right. What gave you the resilience or the courage to listen to that conversation and have this successful lawyer tell you, oh, you don't, you can't do this. All these things will go wrong if you do it. You went and did it anyway. What, well, what was going through your mind? Part of, part of, part of the you're not going to tell me what I can't do kind of, you know, that sort of I am going to prove you wrong. Mm. If you told me that I wasn't going to be able to do one thing or another, then that could make it so that I'd be all mm. the more wanting to prove it. But gotcha. I'm not at all sure exactly how that would play out. Um, I know, though, that a lot of women have mm -hmm. talked to me about wanting to have gone into medical careers or other careers yeah. where they spent um, uh, the first day in their anatomy lab and they mm -hmm. got faint. And then they would go talk to their mm -hmm. their counselor or their the career counselor in college who'd say, well, maybe you should just drop this class. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that our daughter is actually a doctor now, and her mm -hmm. first her first week in medical school mm -hmm. was 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the anatomy lab, and she right. got faint. Yeah. And what she did was she kept at it until mm -hmm. she overcame it. Mm -hmm. And she was teaching the anatomy. Um, she was the teaching assistant for the anatomy after that. And yet a lot of women would tell us how they were discouraged from 
persevering and that that is why they you know didn't follow their dreams so yeah. it, it it's it it really is a a way that we need to encourage our girls and young women to not give up when yeah it looks difficult or complicated. In but, case you haven't figured it out, this is one feisty day. I see that. You just use that as fire to fuel you, which is, yeah, right. we need more examples like that. Honestly, I don't think we, we're not seeing and hearing enough women and men who support them out there saying, you know what, yes, we are, are different in certain ways, but you can do this your way and still succeed with it. I mean, that's... Oops. Such an important the, message. Yeah, part of the problem, I think, is that we take girls and we put bubble wrap around them. Yeah. So that one of the things that we do very often in our conversations or our lectures about how to, um, you know, succeed, be a leader, mm -hmm. communicate, is let your little kids, let the little girls get dirty. Yeah. Don't don't treat them like they can't get their dress dirty or their mm -hmm. tights torn let them run around and let them get in the mud mm -hmm. and uh, one of the favorite um, uh, responses we got after that was a, a mom sent us a photo of her daughter in the playground that night where she <laughs> said she followed our advice and so this girl had an apple in one hand mm. and bought in the other <laughs> and so that's what we need to do we need to let girls know mm. that perfection is overrated one of the um, mm. uh, I think that's absolutely right but one of the things that I think we need to do more mm -hmm. with young girls growing up is they need more contact sports. Mm -hmm. Women are clearly getting involved in athletics after Title IX. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. But the athletics that we think are permissible for women are yeah. often sanitized. They Absolutely. are often, don't let the women get hurt. If they are going to play hockey, uh, so long, that's just fine, mm. but no checking for the girls. Right. Checking for the boys, but not checking for the girls. Well, mm. I think that makes a big lifestyle mm. difference when we allow people to really get in there and mix it up. That is, that's a great point. You know, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but when I think back to childhood, I was steered towards the girly sports. I was in gymnastics. I was, you know, those kinds of things. Right. And within the last few years, one of the things that's taught me more than anything else as far as how to actually succeed in my business has been lifting weights and doing MMA and martial arts at the gym, which are not traditionally girl type not, not things. Not traditionally at all, absolutely. But you learn so much about yourself and what you're capable of when you do things like that that are the maybe tougher, more contact, more risk types of sports. That's, that's interesting. Um, what do you see that we can do differently for boys as we're raising them that would help with this? Because I know sometimes it sounds like you've got to get them to kind of bring down walls and, and be a little more open, which I think we discourage from a young age with boys. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm not a big fan of trying to educate boys to be mm -hmm. more sensitive. Okay. Uh, there's a lot out there about boys need to show their emotions. Mm -hmm. They need to be told that it's okay to cry. Well, that's true, but uh, that may be true, but I don't think that's the issue. I okay. think the issue is raising boys that respect girls, mm. raising boys that see the girls as appropriate to play with, a, as peers, mm. and that I that's think true. we can do a great deal about mm. in terms of making certain that uh, when there are opportunities, we make certain that uh, the boys are including girls, men are including mm -hmm. women, that we find ways mm -hmm. to uh, include... You got our cat walking across. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's, that's showing up right now in the... Yeah movement because mm -hmm. I think the Me Too movement is scaring a lot of men away from 
the kind of mm -hmm. contact with women, the kind of mentoring, mentoring. relationships, yeah. the kind of sponsorship that we need so desperately because men are saying, I don't want anything to do with her. Right. All I can do is get in trouble. There's a yeah. no-win situation for me. There is. I'm very concerned. I think sometimes the intent behind something might be good, but the way that it comes out creates an unintended effect because what we need, I agree, is not more separation between sexes, but, but to be able to see each other as equals and to be able to have those interactions and feel safe. And if somebody feels like at any moment they may end up the next person in the news, um, if that's not creating a safe environment that we can really thrive in together. I couldn't agree Absolutely. with you more. You know, one other point about boys is that the studies show that the girls whose mothers work, mm -hmm. that those girls tend to have higher compensation when they go mm -hmm. into the workforce. And the boys whose moms work mm -hmm. tend to be more helpful and supportive at home and mm -hmm. become more equal partners in the relationships with the women that they partner with later. And so one of the things that we can do is have modeling where mm -hmm. the fathers are doing more in yeah. supporting the children mm -hmm. and being part of their lives that allows them to see that there's different, um, you know, that there's different skills and directions. I just saw the, mm -hmm. um, the um, documentary about Ruth G Bader Ginsburg, Ooh. and her husband was a very, very prominent tax lawyer, a very, mm -hmm. a very prominent, very brilliant guy. And the children, in referring to their parents when they were little, his, um, uh, the daughter uh, said, well, my dad, he's the one, he cooks and our mom thinks. And oh, how interesting. So I thought that was really very powerful because the father was comfortable enough with who he was that he was fine with his kids saying, well, he's the one who cooks and mm -hmm. she's the one who thinks when they were both thinking a lot uh, <laughs> all day long. So wow. that's the concept that we need. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic illustration. You know, I grew up in an extremely conservative Christian family, and my dad worked. He was there in the evenings. He was around for us, but my dad worked. My mom stayed home. And I remember when I was probably about 11 or 12, she decided to go back to work, and she got a job at the school. She was teaching reading to kids, and I remember the passionate discussions that happened as a response to my mom going back into the workforce. And I, even at the time, I remember thinking, but she's so good at what she does. She can help so many kids with this. Why would anybody be upset? I didn't get it. And uh, it was interesting to watch the reactions and the biases that people have to, especially within certain parts of our culture, you're, I think. Like, what is she doing? Yeah. What, can't your father protect yeah. and, and uh, provide right. for her enough? You yeah. Know? yeah, they do. A lot of people take it as an inadequacy thing on the part of the man when it's really not at all. Um, I think relationships clearly work best when they're more of a partnership. Um, you know, and everybody's got to figure out what works for them, but... It's something that it's so important to really look at and see what is going on, what is causing this reaction, and question everything. That's one of the things that I appreciate my parents taught me was question everything. Ask yourself, why is it this way? Absolutely. Um, it took me years to get to where I was brave enough to go on stage for my business. Um, and I remember the first time I was on stage where pictures of it got posted on Facebook, I got a message from somebody in the religious group that I used to be part of, and they said, Basically, you're going to hell. You've elevated yourself literally above men because I was on the stage and there were men in the audience. And it was a how dare I do that. And at the time, it hit me really hard. I cried. It took me a little while to get over it. But I sat there thinking, no, this, this can't be. This cannot be the way reality works. I'm not going to accept that. You know? And, and it's, it's so interesting, though, to see those conversations that happen culturally. Very interesting experience. Yeah. <laughs> and pain, that was very painful, too. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's, it's one of those things that I think sometimes we don't even realize, or I guess that's why it's bias. We don't realize we have it uh, right. until we really go through a lot of personal growth type things. So one thing that I did want to circle back to, I know you guys are working on a brand new book. So let's talk about that one for a minute. Your first book is about bias in the workplace, specifically men and women working together. And now you're working on one that it's absolutely fascinating to me what you shared about women working together well the women the first book about bias in the mm -hmm. workplace it turns out that it, it really focuses on communication techniques yeah. that women have but it turns out that because women and men have the same stereotypes and the same biases then mm -hmm. it's really communication techniques for dealing with women and men at work okay. but Huh. It turns out that when we started to do workshops and talk about our first book, mm -hmm. um, one of the f questions that we would get over and over again is, well, we've talked about all these communication techniques. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. I don't have any trouble working with the men, but... I can't work with women. I hate working with women. Yeah. Or I love working with the men and I hate working for women. The women are evil. They're nasty. They're this, they're that. Yeah. And so I'd start to say, well, tell me, how did the women treat you differently mm -hmm. from the way that the men treated you? Mm -hmm. And without exception, the answer was no differently at all hmm. but it was okay for the men to treat you that way but it's not okay for the women and they're just hmm. both trying to do their jobs and so it became clear that the stereotypes and the biases that hmm. we hold about other women yeah and the workplaces wow. that were put in can make it so that we're in situations where we're forced to yeah. behave in a way that is there's only room for one of us so mm. it's going to be me or it's going to be you but there's not room for the two of us mm. and so we've um we're looking at the different types of situations that workplaces create mm -hmm. and make it harder for women to work together mm. and then providing both information being powerful but then some steps and actions that can be taken to try to overcome that so that there are a variety of different dynamics that mm -hmm. uh, put or bring women into conflict with other women yeah. uh, Andy mentioned one of them women in particular expect other women to be warm caring supportive mm -hmm nurturing you'll be friendly, my mom you'll be my sister and, and when women advance in particularly in male dominated careers mm -hmm. they've got to uh, project decisiveness mm -hmm. and competitiveness and competence they've got to behave like a leader and that means that the junior women often see that senior woman as not behaving the way she's yeah. supposed to, not reaching out, not mm -hmm. picking her up, not right. giving her the support. And that leads to tension between them. You know, it, that is really fascinating because I think sometimes we don't think about it that way. The things that we look at women in business who are um, who are advancing or very successful in their careers or with their entrepreneurial ventures and we see them as, forgive, forgive the language, but we see them as a bitch because they are assertive. They are going after what they want. And yet if a man behaves that way, we He's cheer him on. Job, right. Yeah. Let man go. Yeah. So what, what do you do to help women shift that? And what part of it do you think should be shifted? Well, um, part of it is, uh, going back, part of it is education. Mm hmm Part of it is uh, we can make it permissible in the workplace yeah. for women to be both 
uh, the social scientific term is agentic, uh, forceful, yeah. competitive, ambitious, but mm -hmm. also friendly, also nice. And I think we've got workplaces now in which many senior women are almost leery or afraid or hesitant to show their more communal side. Kindness. Yeah, people yeah. take it as weakness at that level yeah. if you show that. So I think yeah. one of the things that we're trying to do mm -hmm. is, again, to provide the information, the background, to show that there are women out there. There are women out there who are very successful and also mm -hmm. very supportive. There are women who are able to get the job done and find Be time and, and find yeah. time to mentor other women and we need to find space opportunity mm -hmm. and the techniques yeah. to allow them to do that I, I love that because it does feel like so much of the time it's one or the other you see successful women and you feel like they've got to fit into basically doing business in the way men do it to make it work and there's not a lot of discussion uh, that I hear around the fact that you don't have to totally shape yourself into you know male energy all the time to be able to succeed with something well we we refer to that as the Goldilocks dilemma huh. which is that a woman is very often going to be, be perceived as too hard mm -hmm. too cold yeah. too tough or too soft, too kind, too nice. Mm -hmm. And that because of that, women are very often told that we have a very narrow band of when we're going to be perceived as just right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what happens is there's actually some very interesting studies which show that the women who can balance and use mm -hmm. both of the um, harder, tougher, agentic characteristics, mm -hmm. as well as some of the kinder, sweeter, nicer, you know, supportive characteristics. Mm -hmm. Ones that can go back and forth between those as needed actually tend to make more money than everybody mm -hmm. else, including the men, and tend to have more uh, promotions and career advancement opportunities than the men. Wow. So that the trick is to be able to figure out how to dial it up or dial it down, mm -hmm. toggle it up or toggle it down, depending on the situation that you're in. Huh. That is really a different way to look at that, at solving that. Mm -hmm. Like that. Huh. All right. So, you know, I know I've, I've kept you a little bit longer than I usually do just because this conversation is so interesting to me. But um, one thing that I ask everybody when I do these interviews is what's your favorite thing about what you do? Well, one of the I would say probably the, 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 fav the most favorite thing about what I do is that having a chance to think about these issues, to try to solve these issues, and to work with Al on it is probably the most fun because to be able to work together and to have something that we can both care about and, mm -hmm. and uh, focus on together has been really a, an enormous uh, joy to to me and I, I guess I would have to say that that's probably the best part of it I would agree one of the things that I'm often uh, told when I tell people that I write articles and blogs and I speak with mm -hmm. my wife I will get reaction I don't know how you can spend so much time with her. I don't understand how you, you know, uh, for better or worse, but not for lunch. And you guys are, you guys are together all the time. How do you do it? Well, we do it because it's an enormous amount of fun. And what I've found is that as smart as I think I am, together, we're more than twice as smart. I love that. 
That is that is amazing. There are so many people who do either look at it and go, I don't know how you do it, uh, but at the same time are thinking, I wish I could figure out how to do that. And I think more of it may actually come down to some of the gender bias and communication issues than people realize. I think that's probably right. Yeah. Okay, so for people listening right now, what are one or two actions that either men or women can take that would help move us all in the right direction with these issues? Well, I would say that the that the one of the biggest things that both men and women can do when they're in situations that involve a, an aspect of another person's career is to think slow rather than mm-hmm. fast. Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist who won the Nobel Prize mm-hmm. in economics, wrote a book called Thinking Slow and Fast. Mm-hmm. And what he showed is that when we think slowly, that is when we force ourselves to deliberate, and there are tricks to doing that, mm-hmm. we, are, we free ourselves from the biases and the subjectivities that often creep into our decision making. So don't go with your gut when it has something to do with somebody else's career or mm. their 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 work environment. Because your gut can is gonna default to the biases and the stereotypes that you've had since you were three or four years old. Mm. That is a really great piece of advice for people to stop and and think things through, give themselves a chance to step away and go beyond those biases. I love that. Another thing is that we have an assessment on our website, which is 10 potentially gender-biased situations where women are asked to put themselves in the shoes of themselves and men who take this uh, uh, assessment are to put themselves in the shoes of a woman to believe that how would they react to these mm-hmm. situations, not as themselves, but if they were, if they were a woman. And it's an eye-opener. And in fact, what we find is that the men who take it will very often send along comments like, Uh, I always thought that it was going to be just as easy, but in trying to answer these questions from the perspective of a woman, I now understand mm -hmm. how much harder it is for her. And so that's something that could be useful for uh, both men and women. Absolutely. So for everybody listening or watching, wherever you're uh, tuning in today, either below the video or in the show notes, you'll find a link to Andy and Al's website. I'll put a link in there that takes you directly to the assessment that Andy just mentioned. Uh, Also, check out their website because you'll find you can get uh, an excerpt from their book, which will give you a little bit more to think about, to work on as far as communication goes. This is an area I think we all know. We all have some room for improvement, for continued learning. Um, you can find Andy and Al at Andy, A-N-D-I-E, and A-N-D-A-L dot com, Andy, I-E, and Al dot com. Uh, and definitely stop by, check them out. They're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can connect with them as well. They are frequently out there speaking on stages. Uh, if you happen to be in the area at one of their events, or if you know a company who may be uh, able to benefit from what they do, reach out, connect them, put them in touch. Um, I'm looking forward to your next book. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today and have this discussion. It's a really an important one. And thank you for having us. We appreciate it. All right, for everybody listening, make sure you click subscribe, like, rate, review the show, and I will see you back for another episode.